Hi, we're out on the range today, so please bear with gunfire you hear in the background. Today, at long last, we're talking about the 357 SIG, and hopefully this will be the first in a series of presentations on this cartridge. And today we're comparing the 357 SIG to the 40 Smith & Wesson. So before we go any farther, let me show you a close-up of these two rounds. On your left is a 40 Smith & Wesson, and on your right is the 357 SIG, which essentially is a 40 Smith & Wesson just necked down to a projectile diameter of 355. And yes, even though it's called 357, any documentation I've seen reports that projectile diameter is 355, the same as a 9x19. Now for test guns, I've got this Glock Model 22 in caliber 40 Smith & Wesson and this Glock Model 31 in caliber 357 SIG. These two handguns are virtually identical in terms of length, width, height, weight, trigger pull, sights. So that'll take the extraneous variable of the firearms out of the equation. So let's shoot these two calibers side by side and see what we can learn. And we'll start with the mundane task of shooting the chronograph. Now, the problem was coming up with an ammunition that would be considered fair in a chronograph test. And what I've got is this Hornady Custom. For 357 SIG, it's a 147 grain jacket at hollow point, And for 40 Smith & Wesson, it's a 155 grain jacket at hollow point. Eight grains of difference in projectile weight. I think we can live with that. So let's go to the chronograph and see what it tells us. And we'll start with the 357 SIG. 1,282. 1,272. 1,278. 1,293. Now let's try the 40. 1,158. 1,180. 1151 and 1189. Now let's go crunch the number. So how'd we do? With our 40 Smith & Wesson, we got a mean velocity of 1,169. With our 357 SIG, it was 1,281. That's 112 feet per second more. Now granted, the projectile weight is eight grains less, but that's not enough less to account for that increase in velocity. So it would seem our 357 SIG has significantly more velocity. Now in these two ammunitions, I tried to get the bullet weight pretty close, but typically the 357 SIG will shoot a projectile that's a lot lighter than the 40 Smith & Wesson. For example, in this Remington green and white box ammunition, the 40 Smith & Wesson is a 180 grain full metal jacket, as where its equivalent in 357 SIG is a 125 grain full metal jacket. So let's take these two to the chronograph and see what kind of difference in velocity we get. And we'll start with the 357 SIG. 1390. 1380. 1395. 1398. Now let's try the 40 Smith & Wesson. 971. 951. 959. And 970. Now let's go crunch those numbers. So now what did the numbers tell us? Well, with our 40 Smith & Wesson, we got a mean velocity of 962. With the 357 SIG, it was 1,390. That's 428 feet per second more. Okay, that's a lot more. However, it's with a much lighter bullet, 125 grain versus 180. So how does that translate out in terms of energy foot-pounds? Well, if I've done my math right, with the 40 Smith & Wesson, it was 369, and with the 357 SIG, it was 536. That's 167 energy foot-pounds more. So we can say that the 357 SIG is more powerful than the 40 Smith & Wesson. How much more will depend on the ammunition you buy. 
But do those numbers really translate into more effectiveness? Well, let's shoot some different target mediums and see what we can learn about that. Energy foot-pounds aside, there's a mentality that a heavier, slower bullet can do more damage than a lighter, faster bullet. And that does have merit in some applications, but let's see how that stands up to our $2 cinder blocks. I'll go back 10 yards and I'll shoot the target on your left with the 357 Sig 125 grain full metal jacket, and the target on your right with the 40 Smith & Wesson 180 grain full metal jacket, and we'll see what happens. So with our 357 SIG it took 5 shots, with 40 Smith & Wesson it took 6 shots. So let's put up a couple of new concrete blocks, try that again and see if we can confirm that result. So with our first iteration we had 5 and 6 shots, this time we had 5 and 8 shots. However, did you notice at least one of those shots just nicked the edge of the cinder block? So this time the disparity has a little bit to do with shot placement. But with the ammunition I'm using, our 357 SIG had 428 feet per second more velocity and 167 more energy foot-pounds. But that didn't really translate into a whole lot more effectiveness, at least if you're being attacked by a horde of concrete blocks. So we've got our favorite target soda jugs. I guess technically they're bottles, but I like to say jugs. We've got one, then one, then two, then three, and then three water jugs. And I'll shoot these from seven yards, and we'll use our Hornady Custom Ammunition, and we'll start with the 357 SIG 147 grain jacket at hollow point. Well, that was pretty impressive. Now, here's the root beer bottle that was in the front. Split the jug wide open, did a lot of damage to some of our other jugs. The projectile did not make it to the water jugs in back. So I'll set this up again, shoot it with the 357 again, and see if we get a similar result. Well again, the projectile did not make it to our water jugs, and our initial contact root beer jug this time has a lot of damage to it, and the bullet is kicking around in here. So we'll set this up again, and then try it with our 40 Smith & Wesson, and see how it compares. Well the bullet did some damage to our initial contact root beer jug, and again the bullet is kicking around in a bottle of red soda. But it doesn't seem to have disrupted our entire target quite as much. Didn't seem to knock our water bottles quite as far as the 357 did. So I'll set this up again, shoot it with the 40 Smith & Wesson again, and see if we get a result consistent with this one. Now this time the 40 did a lot of damage to our initial contact root beer jug. But overall, which did more damage to our target, the 357 or the 40? You be the judge. Now let me show you a close-up of the projectiles. So on your left are the 357 SIG projectiles, and on your right the 40 Smith & Wesson. You can see they're all mushroomed almost perfectly, but then the soda jugs are an almost perfect medium four bullet expansion. You can also see that the 40 Smith & Wessons have expanded to be significantly bigger than the 357s, but they were significantly bigger when they started. The question comes up whether or not a 357 SIG can penetrate 3A body armor. Well, here's some 3A body armor, and if you were wearing it, your body would have some give, so I've got it attached to this barrel that has some give. And I'm going to shoot it with the ammunition I think most likely to penetrate, which will be this Remington green and white box 357 SIG 125 grain full metal jacket round nose. Now, you may notice our body armor already has some damage done to it. It's been shot a couple of times, but I don't think it's damaged badly enough to really compromise our results. So I'll shoot it from seven yards, and we'll see what happens. Okay, now this piece of 3A body armor is pretty well compromised, but it did stop all five bullets. A couple of them bounced out, but I did recover three of them that were stuck in the vest. Let's take a close-up look at them. And there's those 125 grain full metal jacket rounds after I dug them out of the 3A body armor. And now, of course, it's time for the meat target. And for those who haven't seen it, it's a pork chop pectoral followed by pork ribs, watermelon lung tissue, more pork ribs on the back, leather jacket skin, the lining of the leather jacket will act as clothing. Behind that, as always, the high-tech fleece bullet stop. 
and we're back to our Hornady custom ammunition. I'll go back seven yards and I'll shoot with our 357 SIG 147 grain jacketed hollow point, and then we'll repeat that with the 40 Smith & Wesson and see how they compare. Okay, bullets went through our pork chop pectoral and into our ribs on the front. And remember, these are the entrance holes in the ribs on the front. Lots of damage, pulverized the ribs. Our watermelon lung tissue speaks for itself. All four bullets went through the ribs and through the leather jacket skin on the back. Three of the four were stopped by the first layer of fleece. The fourth one went into about the fifth layer. Let me show you a close-up of the projectiles. All four of these are mushroomed very well and very consistently, which says something about 357 SIG and Hornady Custom Ammo. Now let's see how the 40 Smith & Wesson compares. And again, the Hornady Custom 40 Smith & Wesson is 155 grain jacket at hollow point. Well, we perforated our pork chop pectoral, say that three times fast. Here's our ribs on the front where the projectiles hit the ribs, shattered them. Doesn't seem to have done quite as much damage as the 357 SIG did, but still did pretty well. Our watermelon lung tissue was annihilated, and again, all of our projectiles were stopped by the first layer of fleece. Let me show you a close-up of it. Now, one of our projectiles fell out on the ground and I couldn't find it, but again, we see pretty good expansion. One of them not quite so much, but overall, not bad. Now we saw that the 357 and the 40 performed very well in the meat target at 7 yards, but there's one more thing I want to cover. Hollow point projectiles are velocity based. The faster you propel them, the more expansion you'll get, the more damage they'll do. Up to a point. If you propel a hollow point too slowly, it will drop below what we call expansion threshold, the velocity at which you'll get any kind of expansion. A lot of projectiles, when they leave the muzzle, they are barely above expansion threshold. A good example is 45 ACP 230 grain hollow points. Some of those I've used expand well at 7 yards, but when I shoot a deer that's 50 yards away, in that distance, they've dropped below expansion threshold. So the 357 SIG, with its much higher velocity than the 40 Smith & Wesson, will that keep you above that threshold at longer distances? Well, I've got this battery of water jugs backed up by the high-tech fleece bullet stop, and I'll go back 60 yards and shoot this with our Hornady Custom Ammunition. We'll shoot it with the 357, repeat that with the 40, and see if there's any difference. Well, the concept worked. I recovered the bullet and the expansion was quite good. However, this was not quite as stable as I hoped it would be. So I'll put it back together. We'll shoot the rest of them off camera and I'll show you the projectiles when we're done. So our water jug target did fall apart a few more times, but we eventually got some shots fired and recovered some bullets. On your left is the 357 SIG projectiles, and on your right are the 40 Smith & Wesson, which you can see are expanded quite well. So it would depend on which kind of ammunition you buy, but it would appear that at whatever distance the 40 is going to drop below expansion threshold is probably a lot farther than 60 yards. Well, we're losing light, and what's the takeaway from all of this? Well, on paper, it appears that the 357 SIG is more powerful than the 40 Smith & Wesson. To what degree will depend on what ammunition you buy. And that greater degree of power did seem to give us an edge, albeit a slight one, in shooting things like the soda jugs, the cinder blocks, and the meat target. And it goes without saying that with a velocity that can be 100 feet per second or 400 plus feet per second greater than the 40, depending on the ammo you buy, that at extreme distances like 150 or 200 yards, you're going to have a lot less drop with the 357 SIG. The downside, though, is when I go to the store and try to buy 357 SIG ammo, it is significantly less available than 40, there's less varieties than there are for 40, and the price is almost always significantly higher. So a good round, I'd say yes. The right one for you, you be the judge. So as always, don't try this at home. I'm what you call a professional, and thanks for watching the 357 Zig versus the 40 Smith & Wesson video.